next talk is on CPAP, positive airway pressure treatment in children. So the purpose of this talk is to introduce you to different types of positive airway pressures, uh, indications of PAP in sleep apnea treatment, and the clinical correlates. So just to differentiate between uh, negative airway pressure and positive airway pressure, uh, this is an example of, a, of an iron lung that was uh, invented in 1950s during the polio outbreak that used to expand the lung from the outside by creating a negative pressure. Uh, now, for certain neuromuscular disorders, uh, they use this kind of a device. That's not what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the positive airway pressure which was uh, invented around 1950s or 60s. And now the latest form of it is in a, the form of a very small CPAP machine connected through a hose through a mask to the face. Ventilators were invented in 1950s and it wasn't until uh, 1960s that ventilators were used in newborns. The endotracheal CPAP uh, was used in 1971 and nasal CPAP started in 1973. That's a little bit of a historical background of CPAP or PAP. How does PAP work? It's simple, again, plumbing. When everything else fails, which means the child doesn't have enlarged tonsils, uh, they're not a candidate for an orthodontic uh, intervention, or they're going through an orthodontic intervention uh, for six months or longer, just during that time, to expand the airway from the nose to the hypopharynx, uh, like an air splint, and it almost always works depending on if the child tolerates it. The old saying is, when in doubt, pressurize the snout. So <laughs> it's always gonna work. So what it does is expands the airway. It also helps with the lateral pharyngeal wall collapse, which is a very small subset of uh, sleep apnea in children. Instead of anteroposterior collapse, they have a lateral wall collapse. It also helps with that. It splints the chest wall, splints the diaphragm, and also causes alveoli from collapsing. So it starts at, it, at the nose and works at every level. Indications, a child who either was not a candidate for tonsillectomy, who had tonsillectomy that it didn't work, or it was contraindicated because of a medical reason, or they have craniofacial abnormalities, uh, or the family is, is not for surgery. They, they didn't want any intervention uh, so CPAP is especially for that family. Absolute contraindications slash relative contraindications to CPAP, any history of pneumothorax, um, it may exacerbate it, it may cause it during the night, so it's not uh, for them. Risk of aspiration in kids who are quadriplegic, cerebral palsy, or hypotonic, bedridden, or children with hypoventilation. CPAP is not for them. Uh, it's actually BiPAP that helps them ventilate. Prerequisites for before we put a child on PAP or CPAP or auto PAP. Uh, a clear nasopharynx, which means they have to have Dr. McClay's blessings before they come in. Uh, that there is no obstruction from turbinates to nasopharynx to adenoids and tonsils and all the way to hypopharynx. It has to be clear. And you need a willing child and a tired parent to uh, go for it. Um, how do we make children willing? Uh, that's the next thing. First thing is mask fitting. So the child is sent to a DME or a DME approaches a the child. They fit the child with a mask depending on their orofacial size and their preference. And then they go through, we go through a whole uh, set of interventions, um, positive reinforcement, graduated exposure. In short, you combine a CPAP mask with an iPad, they're gonna wear it. <laughs> and that's exactly how it's done. You, you put a CPAP mask on a child and you give them a, something that they like. These days it's electronic devices. And, and once they take the mask off, you take the device away. So, <laughs> so eventually, so there are uh, several kinds of masks, uh, depending on where they sit on the face. Uh, it can be a nasal pillow, could be a nasal mask, or a full face mask. Children who mouth breathe, uh, they're a candidate for full face mask because you don't want pressure going in through the nose and coming out through the mouth. So they are a candidate for full face mask. And again, 
just like Dr. Weiss mentioned, full face mask may have implications, some structural implications on upper and lower jaw, just facial features, nasal bridge. It causes a very tight pressure on the face. The mask is tightly snug and just to prevent any leaks. So how do we prepare a child? How do we know what kind of pressure is going to work for the child? So the answer is a PAP titration study. In that, the child comes in, has a sleep study at the baseline. This is an example of a split night study, where in the first couple of hours, there was no CPAP. In the middle of night, we started CPAP at a very low pressure, and we keep titrating it up while keeping an eye on the respiratory events. So at the baseline, all these indicate different respiratory events, hypopnea, hyp hypoxia, apnea. And as the CPAP is applied, the frequency gets, starts to get better. And at the optimal PAP, you see there is such a continuous sleep with a continuous REM sleep in supine position. That's the optimal PAP, a REM sleep in supine position, because that's the worst position to have in a worst type of a sleep stage. If PAP controls sleep apnea in that position, that's considered optimal PAP. So just a pictorial view of what normal breathing versus CPAP versus BiPAP is. Uh, CPAP is just slightly higher inhalation pressure, and it fluctuates slightly between inspiration and expiration by a number of two to three centimeter of water pressure. While in BiPAP, this difference is higher. It, it's, it's custom. It can be four all the way to six or nine, like Dr. Shockett likes it at higher levels. This is to ventilate a child, a child who has hypoventilation. They are retaining some level of CO2 with every breath. BiPAP is for them. There's another mode of positive air pressure known as AutoPAP. AutoPAP, when we do a CPAP titration study, just because the child didn't tolerate the study or we were not able to determine the optimal pressure, we set the machine in AutoPAP mode and send them home with the mask and the machine. AutoPAP employs a, an artificial intelligence algorithm that determines what stage of sleep the child is on and how much pressure is probably needed. So the machine delivers that pressure. And when the child comes back in six weeks, we take a look at their download from the machine that gives us an impression of how much pressure was used, let's say 90% of times, and we set the machine at that pressure. So that's a passive way of finding out the optimal PAP. Not really gold standard, but sometimes we have to work with that. This is an example of a, a child who used the machine and, and the machine gives us this information about their compliance, like how many days a week or per day, plus duration of use of CPAP per night. And also, it gives us, gives us an impression of how much leak there was. If there is too much leak, probably the child is on slightly higher than recommended pressure. And some residual AHI, the machine is able to actually measure and calculate how many times per hour the child stopped breathing. So this is the kind of a CPAP compliance report that I want to see when a child comes back. That they're using on most days, as those green bars indicate. They use the machine, and the machine gave them the yellow highlighted one, 13 centimeter H2O pressure, 90% of times. And they use the machine for 97% of the days. The two or three days they didn't use because he had a cold, so the nose was plugged. And if that's the case, there is no use of machine. You can just tell them not to use the machine on those days. When to repeat titration? The child is on a CPAP machine, and when would you think about retitrating or changing something about the pressure? A pressure, a given pressure is, is applicable to a given physiological state or a given structure of the upper airway. Let's say a child goes and gets a, an upper or oral appliance, a maxillary expander, that changes the dynamics of the upper airway immediately. So the CPAP titration should be done while the appliance is in place so you know the pressure for that physical setting. If the appliance is taken out, the dy dynamics have changed. Now you need to retitrate the child. Another reason would be if the child gains at least 10% of body weight because it changes the amount of pressure it's, ne there's, it's needed to keep the upper airway open. Complications, mostly local, mask-related, skin tear, allergies, too much air leak. Some kids tend to swallow air and they wake up with bloated tummies and they burp all day long. 
Using CPAP changes the, uh, the nasal mucosa. It actually changes the histology of the nasal mucosa. Sometimes nasal sprays have to be used in conjunction with using nasal CPAP. And with mouth breathers, if they are using a nasal mask, um, it's not going to be effective because the pressure that is going through the nose is escaping through the mouth. Non-responders. If I diagnose a child with sleep apnea and we have explored ENT and orthodontic options and the child is not a candidate for either one of them, I put them on CPAP and send them home and they still do not respond. I always question the presence of a lingual tonsil, especially if the child has Down syndrome or poor nasopharyngeal growth, high arch palate, or abnormal dentition, as Dr. Weiss mentioned. Or there might be other comorbid conditions that are undiagnosed or undertreated. The child may have narcolepsy or other hypersomniac disorder. They may have epilepsy, which may be untreated or undertreated. They may have pulmonary disorder, hypoventilation, and they may be on CPAP, which is a contraindication. They should be on BiPAP. Or they may have psychiatric or psychological reasons for being excessively sleepy, like atypical depression or mood disorder or seasonal affective disorder. That's a differential diagnosis of hypersomnia in children who are using CPAP and still not responding. So in summary, PAP is one of the, the many modes of treatment of sleep apnea. A few things that didn't get mentioned, uh, but actually probably shortly, uh, was mentioned very briefly, was an oral appliance to advance the lower jaw. Teenagers are a candidate for that because it's not cool to take your CPAP machine to the college dorm. <laughs> so they will love you for that, for the jaw advancement appliance. Uh, another thing that is being done in children with Down syndrome and hypotonia is called hypoglossal nerve stimulator. It's like a pacemaker, but it detects when the child is breathing in. And during that split second, it sends an electrical impulse to the tongue muscles, making them contract and bringing the jaw forward or the soft tissue forward, creating space breath by breath. It is still in trial phase. Uh, Boston Children's has done about 12 kids with Down syndrome with promising results. In coming future, I foresee it as, as one of the things uh, to be explored in children with hypotonia or Down syndrome. So PAP titration study is a gold standard for determining optimal PAP. And initially, they are followed up in six to eight weeks, followed by, when, once they are on auto, uh, six to 12 months. As children grow in size, sometimes they need to be followed up more frequently because with the change in the shape of the upper airway, just normal developmental change or change in their body weight, the CPAP requirements change. And if they don't respond to CPAP, always reevaluate. So that was my brief talk on CPAP. Yes, I'll take questions.